Welcome back, everyone. Um, just a reminder, I see most of your cameras are on. Thank you for that where possible. And if you can just remember to mute yourself, that would be great. Um, Welcome. This is the fifth session in our six part webinars training series uh, around community engagement, uh, understanding the social infrastructure. And as always, we're thrilled to have Dr. Al Condolucci with us today, guiding us through these discussions and teaching on such important topics. And so today I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Al and that he has had a long and illustrious career. I see that it dates back to the 70s, Al, <laughs> in developmental services. And for many years, he was associated with CLASS, which is a full service nonprofit organization providing supports to individuals with disabilities. Uh, he's been an instructor with the University of Pittsburgh, both with the School of Health and Rehabilitation Services and the School of Social Work. He's the author of seven books that have been used around the world, focusing on culture, community, social capital, and macro change. Um, Al is also a family member to a person that has a disability and is quite, um, I find Al quite wonderful to listen to. He's captivating and he makes the work very, very meaningful. So I'm happy to be here today with you all taking part in this series. So welcome Al and welcome you all to today's session. Great, thank you, Aaron and Diane for the um, the administrative and technical support uh, for our session today, and and welcome back, everyone. So so glad that you were able to uh, uh, to join in. Um, we're you know kind of turning the corner on our um, on our uh, saga, our community engagement uh, training series saga. Uh, this is our fifth session. Um, and if you remember, we started a way back in September and our first session was kind of a unified session. We had a full group of, um, of, of players and we focused in on the history um, and devaluation of, um, of folks with disabilities. And we looked historically at how people with disabilities have been treated. Um, and we spent a really a focused amount of time talking about institutionalization and how institutions really became the norm uh, for people with disabilities. And certainly in Canada, the United States, and really all around the world, um, institutions really began to be the answer to the disability problem. Um, unfortunately, these institutions were also, um, you know, gothic kinds of places. They were, there was a lot of abuse and neglect that happened. Uh, people with disabilities were um, were really mistreated, um, and 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 it's just an awful, awful history. And it wasn't until the '60s, the mid '60s, when institutionalization was challenged uh, by advocates, um, and and uh, and and so the the whole notion of trying to find a better way of supporting people with disabilities uh, happened with the deinstitutionalization movement that happened in Canada and the United States and really around the world in the mid 60s. And um, as we began to move uh, people into the community, um, we, uh, we really also, they, 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 they were kept separate in separate programs, group homes and other kinds of settings which led to an isolation and loneliness a reality, which was the topic of our second training series that we did in October of 23. And we talked about loneliness and isolation and how toxic and devastating uh, that those phenomena are to anybody, to anybody who's, who's in, in a situation of being either isolated or when they begin to feel lonely or disconnected uh, from from other people, um, so 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 we focused in on what we you know what light isolation and loneliness are and what they do to people. Um, that set us up for our third um, uh, session, and we began to do our third session in smaller cohorts. And what the reason for that was, we really wanted to do some interactive stuff because this is really 
what do we do about loneliness and isolation? Um, uh, we, we knew that we wanted to have smaller opportunities for conversation. And so uh, in, in November, we focused in on um, the antidote to uh, antidote to isolation and loneliness. What, what is the answer to isolation and loneliness? And that is relationships, social capital. Uh, so we introduced social capital and we talked about um, the whole notion of where social capital came from, what it means and what it does uh, for people. Again, not just people with disabilities, but all of us, any of us, uh, social capital leads to a better life. It leads to greater health. It leads to greater happiness. It leads to greater um, longevity, um, uh, self-confidence, uh, achievement, advancement. Um, all of those things, which are part of the good life or part of a better life, are uh, related to social capital. Um, and so that set us up for our, our fourth uh, session, which was about understanding community and mapping community, because that's where you find social capital. You don't find social capital when you're stuck at home, right? You find social capital when you have the opportunity to be with other people. And that was the focus of our fourth uh, session. How can we find the places and spaces that would connect uh, to what people like and what people are interested in and what people care about, which we focused in on in our third session, uh, looking at the idea of a cultural profile, of some kind of discovery of what people really like and care about. Session four was about discovering community. And so we talked a lot about if somebody was interested in, I don't know, you know, growing plants, um, that we can try to look in the community and see if there are places and spaces where people gather routinely to um, learn about or maybe to uh, enjoy um, gardening and, and growing plants, right? And so when we start to look at community, we talked about how would we analyze community? How would we come to know these places and spaces, which then turned the corner for us to say, OK, we, we if we find a match, uh, then we're at the 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 fifth step or the fifth part of the series, actually the third step in the process. Um, and that is how. Can we understand what's expected in community? What what uh, are the are, are the sort of things about community that would make somebody fit in? That would make somebody become, um, uh, you know, more positioned to not only meet people but to build relationships, to build social capital. And, and that's our session for today. It's understanding the social infrastructure of community groups or settings that we discover in our mapping process. Okay? So what I'm going to ask Aaron to do is if we could tee up our, our, um, um, our PowerPoint and uh, we, um, we can begin to look at some content. What I'd like you to do is as we go through this, if you have any questions or comments or if I say something that maybe confused you or whatever, put it in the chat room. Right? We have the chat feature. You have it up on the on the masthead above your uh, above your screen. You can go to the chat room and put your question or your comment in, and then we'll take a um, a break um, as we get through the first module of content about social infrastructure. We'll open it up to questions. Uh, Aaron and Diane will sort of help um, pull the questions out of the chat room, share them. We'll try to answer them, and then we'll move on into our second module. Okay. So this notion of social infrastructure, if we could have the next slide, please. Um, 
is really about what is the stuff inside a community group that helps people make connections with other people? What, how do people behave? What's expected? Um, what do they wear? What do they look like? What happens when they gather? Um, are there dues? Um, do people take a meal? What's the routine? What are the rituals and the patterns? We're going to examine all of those pieces of the puzzle of social infrastructure. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, previous sessions, we've talked about micro and macro approaches to community engagement, right? And we know that micro approaches are ones that uh, are about the person developing or uh, enhancing um, their skills or their functionality. So it's very internal to the person changing so that they could fit in to a community group. Macro change is when we look at what can we do with the community or the environment to make it easier for somebody to fit in. So both micro and macro approaches uh, are, are involved in understanding the social infrastructure. Uh, for example, um, when, when, when we'll get into some of this in detail, but uh, just to clarify this point is that um, if we discover a community setting and um, we uh, understand that when people get together, the first part of their gathering, they make small talk and people just catch up on what people have been doing, right? Um, one of the micro things we might want to learn from that is what can we, how can we coach the persons we're supporting to get better at small talk, right? Can we help them understand it? Can we help them uh, practice uh, their small talk, right? That's a micro intervention, right? I remember years ago when I first started to do a lot of presentations and I was invited to speak at conferences and things like that, um, I would bring one of my children with me because it, because it gave me a chance to be with them. Um, you know, they got a chance to see what I do. Um, so it, it was, you know, it was a way that I could make up for time that I missed at home because I was traveling. So I started to bring, you know, my, my, uh, my oldest boy, Dante, when he was maybe, he was maybe seven or eight. I started to take him with me uh, to, uh, you know, to conferences. And, and, uh, and, and so I remember, you know, prepping him for that, saying, okay, we're going to be going to this conference. There's going to be a lot of people. Dad's going to be speaking. And um, people are going to probably come over and say hello to you because I'm going to tell them you're here. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, so you know, when they, when somebody comes over to say hello to you, you know, shake their hand. Here's how you shake hands. Right. And I, I was teaching him to shake hands. Right. Um, that's a micro intervention, helping Dante become a little more fluid with social parlance. Right. So as we think about the social infrastructure of the settings we discover in the mapping process, we're going to want to pull out of what we discover about them and say, how can we actually practice some of this? Can we do some micro interventions with folks we support uh, to help them uh, be better prepared for what they're going to experience when they're in community? Uh, next slide, please. Now, Social capital has, is, is the obvious goal of all this. This is why we're doing the training series, is because we know people with disabilities have less social capital, right? Do you remember when we had the session on social capital, I shared with you that the typical person has about 150 relationships with social obligation uh, with other people, right? And, and that that's true. If you sat down and engaged your relationships and you sort of even wrote them down, 
uh, you would be amazed at how many people you have some connection with. But for the folks we serve, that's not it's not true. It's not the same. Right. And 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 those of you, those guys that are working in the community who are on this call and those family members who might be on the call, you know that this is not true. You know that people with disabilities do not have the kind of um, robust relationship uh, networks that you have, right? And um, so, so the whole focus of social infrastructure is to set the table for relationships to begin, right? Next slide, please. And so social infrastructure is not social capital. It's the conditions that social capital thrives under or develops under, right? And, and it's a relatively new concept. In fact, um, I got introduced to this notion of social infrastructure back in the early 2000s, right? When I first started to see, you know, things about social infrastructure. And, and the book that really clarified this for me came out in 2017, right? That's just a handful of years ago. So the notion of social infrastructure is a brand new concept for those of us in this field. And, uh, but it's a critically important one because if the conditions aren't um, right, no matter what we do with individuals, they're not gonna get included. They're not gonna, they're not gonna get a ledge hold in that particular uh, setting. So social, ca social infrastructure is really important for a community to be successful. And, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna share with you the civic use of social infrastructure in a minute, but, but clearly um, community developers and community builders have, you know, th think a lot about the um, infrastructure. Does it make it easier for people to engage. Next slide, please. And so, you know, the conditions in which people um, can start to build relationships include a comfortable setting to meet. It includes nurturing food. It includes that, that, that people um, are introduced and have sort of the 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 start point of relationship building and anytime people gather you want to you want to think about how can we make this gathering more comfortable for people if you're planning something you're planning to have people over for dinner or you're planning you know some uh, some project uh, with your agency that requires people coming in how can you make it comfortable, right? Um, and, and so that's the social infrastructure that sort of sets the table for good things to happen in the process. I, let, me, let me give you an interesting example. I'm, I'm, I'm working right now with a, uh, with, with a group uh, in, um, uh, in London, Ontario. And um, it's another agency, much like Community Living Kingston. And, um, and, and we're, we're planning a world cafe that we're gonna do in October in, in London. And um, the world cafe is a gathering vehicle for community to address issues that the community finds to be important, right? So it's like a, it's 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 a an opportunity for people to come together to process and to solve uh, problems, right? But one of the things about doing a successful world cafe is you want to make sure that the setting is comfortable, and you want to make sure that there's food, and you want to make sure that there's music, and you want to make sure that the there's tablecloths um, and 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 flowers and 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 almost like you're in a cafe where where people oftentimes go to share important stuff with each other right so 
So that, that social infrastructure at work. Next slide, please. Now, there's a relationship between social connections making good things happen. And there's also a relationship between the conditions that people gather in that make then connecting uh, even more fluid and more, uh, more easy. So uh, social infrastructure promotes social capital. Next slide, please. Now, if you back up, you know, and you take a 2,000, you know, a 20,000 foot view of social infrastructure, or you look at the literature, you go, you know, Google social infrastructure and look at some of the, uh, some of the information, some of the content, the academic content on social infrastructure. There's two tracks to it. And, you know, municipalities understand this, you know, cities understand this, um, countries <laughs> understand this. And, and, and the one track is what's called technocratic, right? And technocratic is all the appointments that make it easier to navigate in community, parking, and, you know, uh, you know, good water and sewage and, you know, having the infrastructure elements that, you know, that, that it's a warm setting, that, that it's safe, that people don't feel threatened when they're going there, right? If, if those things are tended to, then relationships build easier, right? And that leads to the second track, which is the civic track. The civic track is really getting people um, to, to in spaces for engagement, right? So, so literally thinking about both sides of this becomes important. If you're going to, again, if you're going to uh, host a party or you're setting something up at your agency designed to bring families in for something, then you're going to want to make sure it's the timing is is it works for people you're going to want to make sure it's easy for them to get to you're going to want to make sure that they have parking you're going to want to make sure that the bathrooms are accessible and that that folks navigate you're going to make sure that people feel welcomed that they have maybe name tags so that they don't feel so anonymous you, that's all infrastructure right that's all the stuff that sets the tone for good things uh, to happen right so these, these notions become uh, critically important in terms of understanding them. Next slide, please. And so aspects of social infrastructure include a whole plethora of community kinds of settings, public settings, common areas, uh, commercial places, all of those things you know, have an infrastructure to them. And the ones that have better infrastructure are ones that are more successful in having people engage than those that don't. You know, I was just this morning, just reading uh, the paper. Every morning I'm read, I read the paper my, uh, here in Pittsburgh, my own community. And, and I was reading an article uh, written by these investigative journalists um, about companies leaving the city of Pittsburgh and um, because their customers don't feel safe. Uh, they're having a harder time parking. There's a lot of homelessness uh, that people are on the streets begging, right? Um, now, all of those things are, are challenges in and of themselves. But what, what was at the core of the article was that companies really just felt that the infrastructure had de had be degraded so much that it just wasn't prudent for those companies to do business in the city, that they could find safer space uh, in some suburban setting that where people could go to their whatever they do, um, a park there or get there on a bus or safely be able to navigate and not you know feel harassed um in in the process right that's 
That's social infrastructure. And so I think there's lessons here in a variety of ways for us on the call. One is a you know very personal lesson that if you're doing something, if you're planning something, even something private, you're having people to your home uh, or, or, or planning a party, um, you want to think about all of these elements that would make for successful connection of people at that party. Next slide, please. Now, social connection, you know, is really what makes communities vibrant. And it's what makes democracy work. And it's, I mean, social connection becomes critical. If people don't have a chance to be together to work things out, then lots of bad things uh, can happen. Next slide, please. So there are, there. Um, in fact, um, before we get to this, let's, let's, let's go back to that last slide, Aaron, if you don't mind. Good, great, thank you. Let's, let's pause here and see if there's any questions or comments that anybody might have uh, in the, have put in the chat room in relationship to this introduction to social infrastructure before I begin to get into elements of social infrastructure. Um, Aaron, are there any questions or Diane, any questions that you guys can see in the chat room that have come up? No, nothing in the chat yet. Does okay. Anybody? Is there anything spontaneous that people might have? Uh, just raise your hand. Um, if you um, have a, something to add or maybe something to ask uh, in a spontaneous way. If you, you see just... Eleanor has her hand up there. Eleanor, do you want to go ahead? Hi, I just thought it was interesting that um, in one of your sessions you talked about this uh, talking cafe or whatever you were you were calling it. But World right cafe. after your talk, actually, I saw something in one of our uh, digital um, media about a talking cafe that I'd never seen before. I think they were just trying it out at the end of January. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah. it talked about casual conversations and community. And yeah. um, they were talking about bringing together seniors and adults um, to combat social isolation and enhance mental health yeah. through friendship building. And yeah. so I was really curious to find out more about it. And I'll actually, it reminded me to go back and see if they're going to host another one. Um, and, and kind of it was it was partnering with the library and it was a, right. a group I'd never heard about uh, yeah. called Compassionate Communities in Kingston. So, wow. yeah, I'll do more homework on that. Thank you. Yeah, that is. You know, thank you for bringing that up. In fact, the World Cafe idea or, or, or format was really launched in the early 90s, 1990, 91. And it was launched as a methodology of helping communities deal with vexing issues, especially issues that might polarize a community. One side believes one thing, another side believes another thing. Uh, one side wants one thing, the other side wants something different. And, and that kind of polarization can, can ruin a community, right? Um, in fact, in the United States of America, that's happening right now with, you know, reactions to Donald Trump, where, you know, you have some people who, 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 you know, see him walking on water. You have other people who see him as a charlatan. And, and, and the two don't, you know, they're, they're not even able to talk, right? So a World Cafe was really designed to try to do a couple things. One was to create a setting that was comfortable that was, you know, where people felt welcomed, where people felt um, like they were they were included, and they were, that other people were happy they were there. And secondly, to um, to to utilize uh, trigger questions that really helped people work out vexing issues, or at least agree to disagree, perhaps, but. But to do it in a way where there where there would be um, the spirit of community as a part of that, 
and one of the things I love about the, the, the World Cafe etiquette is that people are asked to listen in the middle, right? And then when I when I first read that, uh, you know, this goes back to, you know, the early 90s when I, when, you know, I was teaching um, pretty actively in school of social work and got introduced to to the World Cafe format. And and that that idea of listening in the middle was really intriguing to me because so often we listen, you know, in our bubble, whatever our bubble might be. And, and, um, and, and when we're in that bubble, we sort of shut down other maybe opinions or ideas or advice, right? And we all know that the answer oftentimes in vexing issues is somewhere in the middle, right? The, the, the answer is, is, is often in the middle. So the World Cafe format is, is a very, very cool idea. In fact, it's interesting you raise that because you know, Aaron and Diane and I were just talking before we uh, we started our session today about after next month, when we finish our session, what's next? Um, and we we're thinking about the possibilities of maybe having Community Living Kingston sponsor uh, a World Cafe on inclusion and not just inclusion of of people with disabilities. But inclusion of anyone who's marginalized or, or, or somehow you know devalued or, 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 or offset from community. So we may actually decide to do something like that uh, in Kingston itself. So thank you for, for bringing that up. If you're intrigued by that, I just Google World Cafe. Just Google it. You'll find a lot of interesting things come up. There's some great readings. Uh, there's, you know, uh, I have a, a, a wonderful manual that I bought back in, in, in you know, in the 90s um, that I still use. I mean, it's dog-eared and I have all these markings in it, but it, 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 it really is a great primer on World Cafe formats. So any other questions before we move into our second module of content? Okay, so with with that being said, if we can go to the next slide, Aaron, let's let's move on. Let's dig a little deeper into the elements that are often associated with infrastructure, and and begin to get a little bit more conversant with the kinds of things we can actually look for or look at when we discover a community setting that we think would be a good match for someone that we're supporting or someone that we that that wants to get more engaged in community right so in a quick overview there are rituals patterns jargon and memory or history associated with every group with any group that meets on a regular basis now remember a couple of sessions ago i talked about regularity and similarity as the two really important ingredients for engagement, regularity and similarity, right? And, and uh, regularity is when the community meets again and again and again, right? It, it, it has a reason uh, to meet, right? And that regularity really begins to create the opportunity for infrastructure stuff. So let's go to the next, let's take a look at these four one by one. Let's start with rituals. Next slide, Aaron. Uh, rituals are predictable behaviors, right? When people come again and again to, to something or some place that they care about, they begin to establish behaviors that are expected of other people. The best and the easiest example of rituals is found in religious, you know, uh, uh, settings, right? And religious rituals are very, very um, observable, right? <clears throat> you can, in this, in this picture, you know, the lighting of the menorah, uh, a Jewish tradition, right? Um, 
but also, you know, the yarmulkes that people were wearing and, and the, you know, the leavened bread and, you know, the other kinds of things that are, that are ritualistic in this kind of a setting is, is very, very powerful, right? Rituals, you have already been involved with rituals in your life more than you know. Um, when you first started working with Community Living Kingston and you showed up for the first day and somebody oriented you, right? What they were actually doing was helping you understand the setting, the patterns and the rituals that are part of Community Living Kingston. Rituals are these predicted behaviors. Um, I, you know, for me, I have such a vivid memory of when I was a kid, my dad taking me to church. And it was, it, it, you know, we, we walked into the, into the church and there was these big doors and they, they made this creaking sound when my dad opened them. And then my dad said in, there was a little, a little cup of water that was hanging in the doorway. And my dad said, son, that's holy water, right? And I said, daddy, you know, I was just a kid. That, that, that water doesn't have any holes in it. I didn't understand holy water, right? Oh, holy water is, is an abstract concept, right? Um, that's ritualistic, that water has been blessed. And that somehow, if you engage with the water, you're, you know, enhancing your blessing of some sort, right? Now, yeah, so we walk in and then, you know, like dad said, some we're gonna sit in this pew. And I said, pew, the word pew, that meant stinky to me when I was a kid. But pew uh, was a jargon associated with a religious, you know, structure. That's where you sit, right? Um, so, uh, you know, and, and then that, 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 that introduction was so powerful with a, a guy in like, he was wearing, you know, claw like like this hoods, and they came walking in, and they were holding their candles burning, and and people were singing, and we were we had to stand up, and then we knelt down, and then we stood up, and then we knelt down. I mean, the all of those rituals. If you were, if you were like in some alien beamed into a church, <laughs> I don't care what church it is. You would, you would, you know, the alien would scratch your head and say, what the hell is that? Like, what's, what is all this, right? But it's really important to the, you know, to the engagement and successful engagement of that particular community group, right? So rituals are really powerful. If you stop and you think about your, you know, the rituals in your life, um, you'll be amazed. In fact, we're going to have a, trigger question on this so i'm gonna i'm gonna let the the group that has this question really really process it a bit more let's go to the next the next element though and that is patterns <clears throat> patterns are the social movements of the members of the group of the members of the club of the members of the association and you can i i i can i'll bet you uh a dollar to a donut that any group that meets on a regular basis has predictable movements where people, um, you know, have their favorite seat. Uh, they have their desk. They have their space. I mean, even, even silly examples like the Big Bang Theory and Sheldon, you know, uh, Cooper and his spot on the couch, right? That was his spot. Nobody could take that spot. That was his spot. And, and, and this is true in your life. You have your spots too. And in fact, when you first joined Community Living Kingston, somebody showed you, they, they showed you your spot. This is where you sit. You know, this is where you stay. It might've been a carol. It might've been a bank of desks. I don't, I don't know. It might've been an office. But that was your space. And, and you decorated it the way you wanted because it was your space. And if people came in, if you came to work one day 
and you went over to your office or your desk and there was somebody sitting there at your desk. Oh my God. You know, that's, that's like a, you know, that, that, that's they're, they're, you know, it's a faux pas for somebody to take somebody's else space. Okay. So, so the notion about patterns and social movements is so deeply embedded in our culture and in the way, I mean, even people begin to, once they, once they start something, they oftentimes will continue to repeat it. And they'll not only continue to repeat it, they'll go and sit at the same table. My, my mother was, was a bingo player. She went to the church bingo once a week. And if you've ever gone to a regular church bingo setting, I guarantee you that the regulars have their lucky seat. They're, 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 you know, it's where they sit. And, and the notion of, 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 of this, um, this, these social patterns become really important to you and I, because if we're supporting somebody, say, let's say, let's say we're supporting, you know, somebody at a you know, community living in Kingston, and we do a cultural profile on them. Remember, we talked about that at, at, at session three. And that cultural profile, we identify things that they like to do and that they're passionate about. And so the person tells us they're passionate about, I don't know, growing plants, right? And so we say, okay, let's take that and see if we can find a community setting. So we go out into Kingston and we start looking for places where people go because they're interested in gardening or growing plants. And we discover the Kingston Horticultural Society. And they meet once a month and they have a, they have a building where they meet, right? Um, so step three, which is the infrastructure, right? step one is the profile. Step two is the mapping, finding the, the resource. Step three is what goes on at their meetings. When people gather the first Thursday of every month or whatever, whatever is their ritual um, established pattern, then, then, you know, you go to look for stuff like this, because if you're going to bring somebody you're supporting to that, to that horticultural society for their meeting, do you think that people who go regularly have the, have a regular seat or a seat that they usually sit in? And the answer to that is yes, <laughs> they do. And, and 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 if you bring somebody that's going to try to get in the horticultural and they take somebody they take air and seat my god that's not that's not a good start that's a faux pas right so we want to try to enhance every possibility we can to 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 see that the people we care about and support have that first step of connection that the intersection uh, begins to happen for them. So, oh, knowing this, understanding it, and then coaching people around it becomes a critical piece to engagement success. Okay? Next slide, please. Jargon. Jargon are the words that are used, uh, that people use to express interest in a particular topic the topic that they gather around and i've used the word pew or holy water or you know even words like you know ecumenical or beatitudes or you know you could select any kind of a religious word and find its intersection um menorah well you know that words that make sense in the community let me give an example here that that <laughs> happened to be this was a number of years ago but um i was you know I, I when when i got out of the military i was in the, the united states army in in the early 70s and and when i got out, one of the things that i hated most about being in the army but 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 it it grew on me was running every morning they made us run and i hated it uh, and I promised that I would never run again when I got out of the military. 
And damn it, when I got out of the military, I was I was so used to running, I just started to do it. And it was right at the beginning of the running craze when people started, you know, really getting involved in running and running 10Ks and running marathons. And and so I, you know, I was such I was so into running that I joined the Pittsburgh Running Club. Right. It was a it was a group of people we met once a month for business meetings. And then we would get together and train or do runs together. And so I went to one of my very first meetings with the Pittsburgh Running Club. And uh, one of the things that happened at the uh, at the running club was we would have guest speakers, um, nutritionists, or people talking about training. If you're training for a marathon or a, you know certain kind of uh, endurance preparation. Um, we would, we would talk about it. So I was at this early meeting with the runners club and, um, we had this, this speaker and they were talking about training, um, for, for, a you know, 26 mile run. And, um, and, and so they, you know, the, he, 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 the, the, the speaker said, what I recommend for you is that you consider doing fartleks, right? He used the word fartlek. Right? And I'd never heard that word before. Fart, like I didn't know what the hell. I mean, is he talking about leaving gas when you run? Or, you know, I wasn't sure how it fit, right? Um, and, and, you know, so, I, you know, but I didn't want to look like a fool. I didn't want to even raise my hand and say, what the hell's a fart lick, right? Um, so I, you know, I asked the, the guy next to me and he said, I, I don't know. Of course, this was, this was like in the 70s. We didn't have smartphones or anything we could look up at the meeting. So, so after, you know, after the meeting, I ran home and I, I looked up fartlek. And fartlek is a, is a, is a, is a term used for interval training where, you know, you run fast for a short period, then you run a little slower for an, another period, then you run faster for a third period, then you run a little slower for a fourth, you know, that you literally accelerate and decelerate your your running they call it fartlek and um now that's jargon right and and every community group has words that are associated with it um and it, it, you could if you just kind of close your eyes and think about a community group that you're a member of you know say you play in a hockey league are there some terms there that are that are specific to a hockey culture? Yes. Yes, there are. Right. Uh, or if you're interested in, you know, I don't know, growing plants or you're interested in, you know, spelunking or uh, running or, you know, anything. Uh, there are words that are unique to that particular element. Now, one of the things that we do in preparation for the folks that we're supporting, we, we're not necessarily teaching them a lot of words. But we are, you know, really helping people get prepared to engage, right? And some of that really means, like one example from a sense of jargon is small talk, right? That any time you start anything, you know, you use small talk. You know, what's the weather like up there in Kingston? Hey, boy, we got some rain going on here in Pittsburgh today. You know, we do, we do that small little parlance stuff in order to set the table for, you know, more important things that we're going to talk about down the road. So, so jargon is not just the words, the specific words, although it certainly relates to that, but it's also the whole process of communication, of communicating with, with other people. And, you know, communication is, I mean, it's this huge thing. I was just preparing. Next week, I'm going to be, I'm going to be in Wilmington, North Carolina, to do a presentation at a, um, a a conference, an employment disability employment conference, and um, so they asked me if I could come down and and do a pre-conference session on communication. And communication uh, is is you know that's really was the focus of my my doctorate. When I was working on my PhD, I was really interested in how to seductively communicate in a way that people would be um, intrigued, 
to learn more about the topic um, that I wanted them to know about, right? So, so basically, I, you know, I did my my doctoral dissertation on on the on the topic of communication seduction, using I used a a uh, I did an experiment, if you will, where I had an I hired an actor and I wrote a script and I had the actor um, uh, deliver a speech, um, and I had them deliver it the same speech to two similar audiences, but I had them deliver the, the, the first speech in what I called an expressive style, right? Where, where he basically was establishing more eye contact, using more gesturing. He was raising and lowering the tone of his voice. Um, and then I had him do the same presentation to another similar group, um, but use a direct style where his communication was pretty flat, pretty, you know, it was very businesslike. It wasn't very expressive. We've all been around people who communicate like that. And, 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 and so I measured how much they learned pre, pre-lecture and post-lecture, but I also measured how they felt about it, right? Now, the expressive style obviously was dominant and, you know, and, you know, so when it was statistically significant in every factor that I was looking to measure. But, but the long and the short of it, it's the idea of communicating in a way that makes people compelled to want to know you, to want to know more about what you're talking about. To, so, so, you know, this third, this jargon is really, um, you know, a euphemism for not just the words, but the ways we communicate. Now, I know, I know what you're thinking and that, you know, we support people at Community Living Kingston who have difficulty communicating or maybe can't communicate at all, right? And, and so in, in, in a way that really brings up for us some challenges of how might we um, facilitate or how might we support someone uh, what might we be able to do to address this? Because com- communication is that very first ingredient of engagement. It's absolutely critical. We're going to talk more about that next month, actually, when we did our last session and we talk about methodologies of intervention. Okay? So let's go to our fourth ingredient, um, uh, fourth element, if you will, of, uh, of uh, infrastructure, and that's memory. And memory is sort of the history of the group, how it got started, who started it, where did they start at, what's happened over time. You know, our agency, Community Living Kingston, is celebrating our 70th anniversary, right? For 70 years, Community Living Kingston has been in our community helping people become engaged, right? To get, to be included, to be connected. Uh, That's why we were founded. We were founded by family members who wanted to see people with disabilities, not institutionalized, but engaged in community, right? And, and that's, that's our purpose, right? And so for 70 years, we've been doing this. Now you can actually look back on the history and I'm sure you know, I'm sure some of your, you know, your your colleagues, your leaders have done that, where they've kind of gone back to your founding, who the founders and, and, you know, some early annual reports and, you know, newsletters and stuff that, that, that we compiled over the years, right? And, and memory is really important because it, it honors, it honors the, 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 the rationale of the group, why it was founded, um, and and that that every one of us have been involved in memory. You know, I my wife and I were cleaning out the closet of one of our one of our bedrooms, and and we found some um, scrapbooks, right? That that we prepared. Actually, she prepared <laughs> when 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 our um, when our kids were born, right? 
And they start actually with pictures from their sonogram picture all the way, you know, to, you know, their grade school pictures and pictures like the one you see on the screen right now. Uh, they're all embedded in this, uh, in this scrapbook. But one of the things about the scrapbook that was so intriguing to me is as the kids were growing, they loved looking at that scrapbook, th their scrapbook. And there was one for each of them. We had three kids. And they would each um, look at their scrapbook. And that look at there was when we went to Disney World. Do you remember that we, we, we had when we did this and we went there, we went to the beach and 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 that those memories, right? Um, were were really things that strengthened us as a family community, if you will, right? And 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 so memory becomes really an important part. Like, how did this start? Who were the starters? Uh, and 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 to celebrate the uh, you know the vitality of the group. I, I belong to a to a group. Uh, I'm a member of a group that's called the Social Capital Social Justice Conversation Group, right? And it's a group of people who are interested in social justice. And we get together once a month and we talk about social justice, you know, things that affect social justice. Uh, you know, when, when things happen, look, for example, five years, six years ago, when the, when the, uh, uh, the you know, light of life congregation was, was attacked here in Pittsburgh by a gunman who, who shot 13 uh, people in 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 their synagogue who were who were, you know, praying, um, and and to and, and so as a group we we get together to talk about how do we create a more just society, right? And now we don't have we don't have any focus like we don't have any president or bylaws or dues or any of that. You know, some groups have that a formality to it. This group just meets once a month. Those who want to come, come. Those who can't make it, that's okay. And we don't do anything. Like we don't try to, we don't create anything or we don't write a grant to get funding for something. We just talk, it's really for our own edification, for our own betterment as human beings in understanding social justice. So groups gather for all kinds of reasons but there's a history. We talked, in fact, our last meeting, which was last week, um, we talked about the very first meeting we had was at like a Panera's cafe. Um, and it was eight years ago, eight years ago. This, this group's been meeting for eight years with no bylaws, no formality, other than people interested in discussing and talking about how do we make a better community. So, you know, people gather for all kinds of reasons, but there's a there's a history to the gatherings, and that becomes an important piece of the puzzle. So, next slide, please. Okay. So, this idea of connecting with people um, becomes even more important today than it did in yesterday, because we're seeing a change, we're seeing a shift from neighborliness to friendship. People still need people and they wanna be with people, but they're shifting from spending time with neighbors to spending time with friends. Now, some of that has been accelerated by virtuality, you, you know, internet, social media platforms, um, and by technology in general. but but it's also been, you know, an interesting trend uh, for, you know, what happens to neighborhoods, right? As people don't connect as much, the the degradation that happens sometimes in neighbor neighbor in in neighborhoods um, can really be um, can be devastating, right? Um, and so, you know, this this notion of neighbors and friends becomes an interesting uh, element to social capital. 
because some of the purveyors of social capital, people like Robert Putnam and others who have done a lot of research and study on social capital, talk about neighborliness as a cornerstone of social capital and a cornerstone of, of vibrancy, of, of, of democracy, right? And yet where studies in Canada and the United States are really showing that there's, there's some shifting there. So, uh, you know, that, that it's an interesting uh, issue uh, to, to think and contemplate. How many neighbors do you know? How many neighbors have you engaged with this past week? Um, as compared to how many of, you know, friends or group settings have you participated in, you know, in this past week? Um, just an interesting, uh, uh, interesting thought to ponder. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> investment in social infrastructure is, becomes an important um, vehicle, right? that we want to make sure that that I mean municipalities and cities governments um have really really looked at this and have been concerned that if if um if the infrastructure becomes degraded uh, it weakens social networks that that people just won't go as much or they won't participate as often um uh, and 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 so the you know what happens with degradation in a in a in a more governmental or civic way is that crime is often associated with a degraded infrastructure. Distrust rises. People begin to fear other people more often. Civic participation actually begins to plummet. So. So the notion about investing uh, in infrastructure becomes important no matter what you do. I'm going to show you a couple examples um, of, 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 of ways communities have, have dealt with this. Next slide, please, Aaron. So a couple of these slides. I'm going to just show you a couple pictures, but um, uh, these are all examples, um, international examples of uh, things that have been done to restore the infrastructure, to, to restore the spaces so people could gather, so people felt um, comfortable and safe. Next slide starts with the High Line. And the, the New York High Line is in the Chelsea district of Manhattan. So if you've ever been to New York City and you've ever been to Chelsea, um, you know, the High Line is located there. Now, the High Line was the elevated rapid transit system that was in that particular region of Manhattan uh, for years. Um, and then they, they enhanced or upgraded the subway system and they added an underground, you know, subway line that would serve Chelsea. And the, ele the elevated transit really fell out of favor and then it fell into disrepair. So it was just this albatross in Chelsea. It was ugly. It was, you know, the crime was having drugs and other kinds of things were going on. And the community got together, the community of Chelsea, and they said, let, you know, their first thought was, let's just tear it down. Let's promote that they tear it down. They said, well, wait a second. This is, this is, this is space, right? It's elevated space that maybe we could reclaim or use. And so they, 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 you know, banded together. They got some funding. They worked with uh, municipal government and they created a park in the, uh, on the high line. And um, when I, my son, my, my youngest son lives in New York city and uh and uh, so when I found out about the High Line, you know, I, I, you know, and I was going, it gave me a reason to go visit my son, but also he took us over to Chelsea and we, we got a chance to walk the High Line. And, and, you know, this space, green space, and they put benches in and there are pavilions where people could 
take uh, their lunch up there and eat together and 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 have coffee and walk and runners were able to use it and you know folks walked their dog they had a dog section where there was like a little dog park i mean it was really this cool use of space that really allowed people to gather right and when people gather social capital can happen right let me show you the next one which is uh the um uh it, the atlanta example the belt line and uh the belt line is in the uh uh you know it was an old rail line that was reclaimed the community got together really made it um vibrant utilizable space for community members who lived uh near the belt line uh be able to walk their dogs uh, put in park benches and did things um that were um that were just um uh, that just in, enhanced, you know, the con the the ability to connect uh, for people. Next slide, please. So the next slide is um, the Anzac Bridge in Sydney, which was also repurposed and utilized uh, for for community purpose. Next slide is um, this notion of shared uh, physical environment. Uh, these examples um, uh, present possibilities where people could could go and gather. But it's not just this kind of outdoor space like the High Line or the Belt Line, uh, the Anzac Bridge. Th those are great examples of outdoor space. But there's also indoor space that really um, can also serve the very same purpose uh, of hosting uh, people. And um, libraries, um, in fact, the, the entire book uh, called Palaces for the People by, by Eric Kleinenberg, a sociologist at University of Chicago, who really talked, I mean, a lot of the book, it talks about social infrastructure, but a lot of it talks about how libraries today provide this kind of space that libraries have become really repurposed from you know what we grew up with to what they are today oh you know they're more than just where you can borrow a book uh, they really become gathering spaces uh, people get the you know they learn about things there's meetings that go on there there's you know computers available to folks who don't have um don't have access um you know it they they really create this bridge uh, for people uh, to, to to enhance the quality of their lives. But community centers, rec centers, gardens, I mean, all of coffee shops, all of these things uh, present places where people uh, can gather. Right? They enhance the, 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 the possibility of relationships forming. Next slide, please. And so, you know, last session, we talked about mapping community, really discovering where places are at. We talked about meetup.com and other ways we could begin to search community for resources. Right? But now what I'm suggesting is once you find the resource, you want to analyze its infrastructure. Right. It, you know, how does it feel? Is it does it feel safe? Is there parking? Will people, you know, do, is it, you know, warm enough? Is it not too loud? Uh, you know, other kinds of things that can that can lessen the uh, connectability of people. Next slide, please. So once we once we identify the target, the infrastructure, then we're really in a position to begin to think about how might we soften the social infrastructure, right? Uh, how might we make it um, more possible for the folks that we support um, to engage and really, and, and become accepted, right? Now, obviously understanding the rituals, the patterns, the jargon, 
the memory, that becomes an important element. But here's some other things that add to that. And that is when, when somebody really get, begins to uh, join a, a, a group, maybe they, they want to go to the horticultural society me they want to they want to join that that group right um and, and so it's not just a matter of joining but to really begin to say you know you you want to make a commitment right and 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 that commitment means going again and again and again and really participating being on time fitting in uh volunteering for things uh you know wanting to uh, you know, wanting to see that group succeed and excel. Um, also, looking at the ways to fit in. This gets to things like how people dress, and and you know where not just where they sit, but what they do, and how might we enhance the possibilities of the folks that we support to be to have a better chance of being connected and then respecting the culture this notion of cultural humility is really an an important tenant of um uh, of of um, diversity right equity diversity uh, issues is respect for the for the culture and being recognizing that you know your culture, your back, your 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 culture of, of origin, is not the only one or the best one. It's just it is just one, right? That's cultural humility, uh, and so these kinds of pieces really set the table for the final piece, and this is the one that will seg will segue into um, into our work groups on is uh, the gatekeeper, right? Now. Every community group, there are there are gatekeepers um, in every community group, and a gatekeeper is somebody already in the group um, who has some influence with the group. They're already a member. They're already in the horticultural society. They're already you know they already work at Community Living Kingston. You're just coming in to work. They're already there. They're indigenous. They're they're, they they they've gotten there before you, right? And um, they have some very powerful influence. Let me let me tee up the next slide, Aaron, um, to really kind of set the table. The gatekeeper, if you just think about it visually, opens the gates to allow new people to come in. Now rec recognize that there's also people in the group who could close the gates, right? saying we don't want you in our club or with our group, or we've never had somebody like you or not in my backyard kind of mentality, right? So not only are we looking for a gatekeeper, but we're looking for a positive gatekeeper, kind of person who would open up the gates and say, come on in. Hey, good. We're looking for new members. We're happy you're here. Let me, let me introduce you around. Let me show you um, what we do. Okay. Next slide, please. So the finding a gatekeeper becomes a really important strategy for me and you if we're really going to try to enhance the possibilities of, of getting people not just in the community, but of the community so that they can begin to build relationships. Right? And what the gatekeeper does is... It actually, he creates or she creates a, um, a framework of social influence, right? Now, social influence theory is a very, very powerful, um, uh, you know, phenomena that has worked in your life more than you know. But social influence theory is essentially when somebody who has influence or is valued in the group when they do something or they behave a certain way or they buy a certain product or they connect with a certain person raises the value of that product 
idea, or person, right? They raise the value. That's social influence theory. Actually, the subcomponent is called value um, uh, juxtaposition. It's all, all that value juxtaposition is. If somebody's valued and they're drinking a certain tea and they're, they're telling you, wow, this tea that I drink, it's a, you know, it's really good. It's called Twinings and it's, it's, it's a great tea because it has turmeric in it and it's really good for you. It's healthy. It tastes great. Right. So now if somebody you value tells you that or shows you that or recommends that, the chances of you trying it go up. Right. Um, you, you, you begin to say, wow, you know, maybe I'll try that turmeric tea. Al Condalusi really seemed to, to think it was great. And um, and we like Al. He's a nice guy. Boy, he's been helping us with some training. And so I think I'm going to try that. Twining's uh, turmeric tea. <laughs> so now, the the notion of social influence is 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 the key, is a key ingredient to somebody being acceptable to the rest of the members. It's it's a it's a powerful example. In fact, my son, my younger son Santino, I mentioned he lived in New, he lives in New York. And uh, he works for an advertising firm, right, in Madison Avenue, and 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 basically what that's what they do, they use social influence theory to sell products, right, and and I just started consulting with them because they just got a grant from the state of New York to recruit DSPs, right? We, we all know that folks who do direct support. That we're, that that we're finding people is hard, and getting good people is really is harder, and and so there's a lot of effort to try to recruit uh, people to work in, in direct support professional roles. So his company just got the, they won this grant uh, through the state of New York to do an advertising campaign, promoting that people, you know, become DSPs or or sign up to be a DSP, right? So what, you know, we had a meeting just yesterday to talk about how, you know, what kind of messaging would actually help that happen, right? Um, would get people, would people would be influenced enough to say, I think I'll sign up or, you know, wow. You know, is the person who pitches it, if the person who pitches it is somebody you value, that's gonna automatically get your attention. And make you maybe think about doing what they're asking you to do, or what they're their behavior, you know, what they're modeling for you. So social influence theory is is the is the social construct behind the gatekeeper, right? And now here's the we're going to do a little exercise to say, you know, how will we how will we know a positive gatekeeper if we go to the horticultural society? And we check it out. We go to check out its infrastructure. One of the things we're looking for are people who might serve as gatekeepers. So when you bring the person you support there, there's somebody that they can start out with, at least say hello to or inter begin to introduce them. Right? So next slide, please, Aaron, begins to tee this up. We're going to do a little exercise right now to try to um, explain this uh, this construct of positive gatekeepers, right? And how we might be able to recognize them. And we're going to do this little modified people awareness exercise. Now, you guys might have gotten uh, from Sherry and the leadership team um, a copy of this. But if you haven't, we're going to work off the screen. So next slide, please. Aaron, if you can bring this up. You do you some of you guys may have this in front of you. If you don't, we can work off the screen. But here's what I want you to do. Um, I want you to look at this list of there are 40 descriptors, 40, right? The upper left, the lower left, the upper right, the lower right. 
there are cohorts of 10, right? So what I want you to do is I want you to look through each of these cohorts, and I want you to either check off if you have this in front of you or write down on a sheet of paper which items you think define you, describe you, right? So look at that upper left quadrant. Precise. If you're really a precise person, then check that or write that on a sheet of paper up in that area. Put it up in that area of your paper, of your, you know, the paper that you're transposing to. Um, if you're a perfectionist, check that or write that down. If you're cautious, check that, write that down. Um, go to the to the bottom, you know, left hand side. If you're an impatient person, write that or check that. Um, argumentative, decisive, bold. What you're doing is you're thinking about yourself and you're just identifying. Don't overthink it. If it if it if you're not sure if it works, think about people who know you and say, would they say that about me? And if they wouldn't, then just leave it. Don't don't put it down. And also don't think about it situationally. Like some of us can be impatient if they lose our luggage at the airport, right? But we're not necessarily an impatient person all the time. I want you to think about how you are all the time. Then go up into that upper right. Talkative, expressive, popular, sociable, charming. The bottom right, traditional. Amicable, worrier, diplomatic. Any of those things you think apply to you, write them down. Or check them off if you have that sheet in front of you. Okay, so don't take, it's not real hard, don't overthink it. Don't, you know, we're not analyzing you. You're not in the couch right now, on the couch. Uh, with Dr. Condalusi, you're you know you're sitting in your office or your home, and you're we're just doing a kind of a fun thing to make some points about gatekeepers. Okay. Now, once you've gone through each of the quadrants, the ten items in the quadrant, you've identified them. What I want you to do now is I want you to tally up how many check marks or variables you identified in each quadrant. Okay, so upper left, lower left, upper right, lower right. How many variables? Just a number, numerical. So maybe you had four in the upper left. Maybe you had two in the lower left. Maybe you had six in the upper right. Maybe you had one in the lower right. Okay? Whatever your totals are. And then I want you to bring down the total on each side. So you're, com you're, you're combining the upper left and the lower left numbers in just a, a, a grand total. So if you had five in the first one and two in the second one, that would be seven on the left side. And maybe you had nine on the right side when you combine them. Okay. Now, the last thing I want you to do is I want you to look at the upper right and I want you to circle that number, just that number on the upper right. Okay. Now, just for debriefing purposes, uh, this is a little exercise that, that ferrets out right brain, left brain behaviors. Okay? And and basically what it does, and as you know, you know, our brains have actually four parts to them, you know, more than that, but but just in a more simplistic um, explanation. We have our frontal lobe. That's right where our forehead is. That's our most, it's the newest part of our brain, and it's where our executive thinking happens. We also have in the back of our, our brains the occipital lobe and the brain stem. They're in the back part. 
And if you feel on the back of your head, you know, that little kind of like lump that comes up in your cranium, that sort of differentiates where the brainstem starts and the occipital lobe ends, right? And then on the left and the right side, you have temporal lobes, left temporal, right temporal lobe. And what neurologists now know is that this each side of our brain controls different kinds of behaviors and and different kinds of um, facets of how we navigate through life. Right? Um, the left side of our brain is much more organized and logical. It's much more cautious and precise. It's very um, it's very uh, algorithmic and linear, right? The left side of our brain. The right side of our brain is much more intuitive and emotional. It's much more, um, you know, musical and and magical, right? The the right side. It's more quantum. The left side is more Newtonian, right? in terms of how we how we process and how we navigate and the right side uh, of our brain um, is much more social than the left side of our brain right and so people's behaviors can can oftentimes match this little test begins to identify the left and the right brain dominance of your interpreted behavior, okay? But it's these four, or excuse me, these 10 items on the upper right that are much more, you know, dominant in terms of right brain behaviors. Now, the reason I tell you that is because what we know, and we actually know this through advertising research, is that right upper right brain thinkers are people who are more apt to be gatekeepers, to take social risk, to take some risk and try something new or do something new or do something different. The, the people on the upper right. And so the next slide, if you can, Aaron, if we can bring it up, you know, really blows those 10 variables out a little bit more. These are the dominant right brain behaviors that are observable. You can ask these 10 variables are ones that you can actually see. And, you know, you can, you, you can almost predict that if you went to somebody who was behaving like this and you, you told them, you know, I'm, I'm with a friend of mine, you know, we just, we're, 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 we just joined the Horticultural Society. Uh, I'm not me so much. I just came to really, you know, assist my friend. Um, would you introduce them to some of the other members? Would you help? If you just raised that up, um, the chances of you went to somebody who is behaving like this, that you would be more successful, that that person would be more apt to say, of course, yeah. Come on in. You know, let me introduce your run. It's not doesn't guarantee it's going to happen, but there's more of a likelihood that it'll happen because these right brain behaviors have been associated with people who are willing to take more social risk. Okay. Next slide, please, Aaron. So Enlisting a gatekeeper becomes an important intervention, right? Because you can't take, you know, I don't know, you can't take Rob to the um, to the Horticultural Society meeting and go in and say, you know, the first day that Rob shows up, say, hey, Horticultural Society members, you know, my name is Dr. Condalusi. I work for Community Living in Kingston, and, you know, and we support Rob. You can see he has a little bit of disability here, and he struggles a bit, but Rob really is interested in growing plants and, and, and won't you be his neighbor? You know, you, you can't do I mean, you could do that, but that would be the worst thing to do. Right. 
uh, because you have no value there. You're not known. We got to find somebody who's known, who's already established in the horticultural society. So this notion of finding gatekeepers becomes really an important ingredient to community building. And by the way, this is true no matter who you're, are you supporting your son or daughter to get involved in an ice skating group or, or you know, dance ensemble or that, that, I don't whatever it is, you can't, you know, you can't force other people to accept her, right? All you can do is try to position her in a way and see if some introductions can lead way to her being introduced by somebody already inside the group. Next slide, please. And so every accomplishment starts with the decision to try. Okay? For 70 years, we've been trying to get people engaged in community. And, you know, we've been successful in some ways, but more unsuccessful than successful. Right? And that doesn't mean that community living in Kingston has, is bad it, 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 or doesn't know what it's doing. I think it's just we haven't used these strategies, these interventive uh, sociological strategies of connection. Right? And as we begin to think about using these and begin to um, uh, get people connected in ways that, that, that fall on fertile ground, uh, we're going to be more successful. They're going to be more successful in building relationships. And as they build more relationships, their life gets better. Good things start to happen. All kinds of positive residue follows. So next slide, please. Where you are shapes who you will be. Right? And if people just stay in their living room, if they never go out, if they never do anything, then, then that's the kind of person that they're going to be. And so uh, understanding this and recognizing uh, that it is a social relationship connectability issue um, is at the core of everything I've been trying to say. Next slide, please. So let me just conclude, and then we're going to get into our work groups real quick with a little bit of a conversation about some of this. Um, this is a passage from um, Peter Block. And the book is called um, The Art of Belonging. And um, Peter Block has done some amazing writings about infrastructure and things we can do to make, to be more inviting. And uh, I, I really love this little passage, right? Block says, the need to create a structure of belonging grows out of the isolated nature of our lives, our institutions, and our communities. The absence of belonging is so widespread that we might say we are living in an age of isolation. Certainly, the pandemic exacerbated that. And ironically, we talk today about how small our world has been. The cost of our detachment and disconnection is not, is not only our isolation and our loneliness, but that, that there are too many people in our communities whose gifts remain on the margin. Filling the need for belonging is not just a personal struggle for connection, but also a community problem. Community offers the promise of belonging and calls for us to acknowledge our interdependence and to act as an investor or an owner or creator of the space that we, that we inhabit. To be, to be welcome, even if we are strangers, as if we, uh, as if we came to the right place and affirmed uh, for that choice and are formed our firm for that choice. So Block kind of gets it. And what we want to do now is talk about social infrastructure. Next uh, slide, tease up our questions. So you're going to go into five groups and you're going to have one of these questions uh, assigned to you. And we're going to ask you to think a little bit about the question and then write down some answers to it and then discuss it. Unfortunately, we're only gonna have 10 minutes uh, for this task, um, but let's do that and then we'll do a quick reconciliation and close out for the day. Well, then let's do a quick um, debrief 
Um, you know, we had five questions that were related, of course, to infrastructure and just, uh, you know, just as a catalyst for for some conversation about some of the points that we made <clears throat> in our session. So let's start with um, group one and uh, group one, uh, whoever the spokesperson is, um, if they can introduce themselves and then just a quick summary on their conversation. So group one, who is any, who is the spokesperson? That would have been Karen and Donna. Karen and Donna? I see Donna there. Okay. Did um, any of, okay. I'm Go sorry, ahead. but I was the only one in the chat room. Huh. I could not see <laughs> the chat icon, so I don't even know what the questions were. Okay. okay. So I had a bit of a break because so I couldn't get back. So I'm um, sorry. Okay. No, no worries. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's okay. That question was really um, take one community that you participate in and identify the rituals. This was just to, you know, have us think about one place that we go, you know, in the, in, in, in the content that we just did talk about church. You could talk about any place or any group. Um, maybe, a, 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 you know, a, a, a morning walk group around your neighborhood. And what are some of the rituals? Well, we meet, we stretch, you know, we, we, we chat about, uh, you know, how the, the day went. We start our walk. We walk really fast the first month, you know, just the things that are that are expected or that unfold with the group. So so that question was on rituals. Let's go to group two. And the question that group two had is, if you wanted to be accepted by a group, what behavior would be most important? And Aaron, we, we were just, we, uh, just discussing that when yeah. we came in. So maybe Caroline, could you, uh, could you uh, summarize a little bit of some of the conversation? Caroline, you were in that group, weren't you? Yeah. Caroline and Karen. I think Karen was the spokesperson. Karen, oh, okay. did, you, Karen? did you write Good. everything down? I did, yeah. Okay. Good. What'd you get, Karen? Okay, so we had said that it was really important to be open-minded um, and to come in willing to experience new things, uh, to try to be on time and try to gain any information that you can by going ahead of time. So maybe go the week before, see what it's all about so that you can bring all the information back when you go with the individual that you're supporting. Uh, we said once the individual is there, giving them space and time to speak their mind, to have their emotions and their feelings. And if it's not successful the first time, maybe it would be the sex second time. Try to plan um, by preparing the individual about what to expect. So if they're going to do handshakes or fist pumps or let them make their choices um, before you go in. Um, and then after that, once they're in, encouraging the community community part by uh, using teaching and role modeling. And then uh, if you're not able to make it or if there's a change of plans and even after the event has happened to record um, what to expect and then after to record what happened so that next time you have some more information about the next time they attend that event. Great. Good. Karen, thank you. That's a good summary. Let me just add one other piece here to this, this particular question. And that is, you know, we, when we talked at the beginning of the session about micro and macro, um, and, and we, we um, said that there are obviously some micro things we can um, work on, uh, or we can suggest, um, and maybe even role play or practice. Um, but there are some, you know, maybe things that go on with the group that the person is not going to be able to do just by virtue, perhaps, of their disability or 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 their situation, right? And and so recognizing that that's really where the macro change comes into play. However, macro change doesn't happen unless the group wants it to happen, unless they decide to adjust or elasticize in order to incorporate the new person in. So that's a that's something that can only happen 
when the group decides that it will do something different in order to accommodate the person. So, so the, um, uh, the notion there is we can only go so far with micro issues. We can try to promote or, 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 or recommend some macro change, but we can't demand it. We cannot demand that a group is going to change just to, to, to accommodate uh, the person we care about. At some point, when they see the humanity of that individual, they will accommodate. But, but it has to be organic. We can't force it. We can't demand it. We can't, um, you know, uh, shame them into doing something different. It's got to happen organically. Okay. Great, great job, Karen. Thank you. Let's go to group three. Group three was focusing in on gatekeepers. So uh, who was, is there a, a spokesperson for group three? Hi there. Yeah, I was. It was my, myself and Kim that was in the group. It's Tamara here. Hi, Tamara. And hi. And so, yeah, when it came to gatekeepers, um, we focused in on the characteristics um, and basically that like a host came to mind or the uh -huh. person that came up to you and introduced you to others. If you were alone and, you know, maybe it's the person that uh, saw you being alone and started introducing you to others to help you feel more comfortable. Comfortable. Um, so some of the characteristics of that, that those types of people that came to mind were someone that's trusted, um, someone you feel comfortable around. Uh, maybe you see other people kind of maybe not flocking to them, but they, they're kind of the go to. They're knowledgeable. Um, yeah. So those were some of the things that came to mind. Welcoming, talkative, trusting um, the person that kind of goes out of their way to to reach out to you as well yeah, um yeah. and and something kim said that was interesting was um yeah they're noticed in a crowd yeah you know nice. for all of those yes. reasons yeah. that's exactly right good job tamara great conversation with your group let's go to group four just for the matter of time here so we we can conclude on time group four had um uh the question on social risk and so um who was the spokesperson for group four that was and, myself and then Curtis and Todd were in my group. And great. out of all the questions I had said, and a couple, you know, our group agreed that that was almost the hardest question to answer, but um, kind of saw it as, uh, you know, two faceted. It's someone who is willing to bring someone into the fold, not really sure how, knowing how they're going to fit in, but maybe willing to go that extra mile to really help the person um, get accepted. But then the other part was to uh, maybe even willing to take a social risk to themselves, knowing that it might be a tougher fit and a tougher welcome, but they're willing to um, risk their own maybe reputation or, or whatever to make yeah. that happen. Yeah, yeah. Great. Good, good, good conversation. Even as short as it was, this is an interesting issue, this idea of social risk. And, uh, and, and I think the uh, summary was, was really a good one. Um, the type of person who takes social risk <clears throat> is oftentimes one of those right brain thinkers that we that we talked about when we did the little exercise, right? People who who are willing. Oftentimes, women tend to be more right brained and are more willing to take a little more social risk than men are. Men oftentimes become pretty superficial about things and <clears throat> and and don't dive in. Um, in a way that that is required with social risk. So good job on that. We're going to go to the last question, which was about uh, what characteristics make a positive gatekeeper. So who was the spokesperson? It was me. So I was in the group with Maureen. Um, the, we had a really good chat about the characteristics of a positive gatekeeper. So we said someone who is really welcoming, um, even physically, like smiling, eye contact, um, someone who's outgoing and social, also animated and expressive, so maybe more gesturing. Um, maybe someone who would cue you, so see you coming in the crowd and kind of cue you to come over and start the conversation. Um, yeah, someone who starts to engage with you and introduce themselves. Um, and just someone that helps with all of that, um, they reduce your anxiety because it's a lot of anxiety stepping into a group. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Great, uh, great, great job on the questions with group, all the groups. Um, certainly the notion of the gatekeeper we're underscoring. Next, um, next month when we when we finalize uh, our, our training series, 
um, we're going to not only we're going to kind of go back through some gatekeeper stuff, not nearly like we did today, but we're going to do it more in a summary fashion because we're going to recommend some key intervention strategies um, that 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 you can do in terms of putting these four things uh, together. So a great job today. We covered a lot of content. I want to thank, um, you know, Aaron and Diane for their technical support and ask them <laughs> if there's any uh, final, um, uh, uh, you know, official information that needs to, to be imparted before we conclude. I Diane? would just like, yeah, thank you, Al. I would just like to add that for those people who were the scriber or the spokesperson for their group from Community Living, can you please send me a summary? of your discussion from the group so that we can add that. Um, and thank you. Great. Erin, any parting uh, comments? I would just say thank you again. And I think today is the first day that I've ever heard the term communication seduction. And now knowing that you did your <laughs> PhD in it, Al, I understand where I am captivated every time we listen and I couldn't find the next slide half the time because I was making notes. So I get it now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Hey, guys, thanks so much. Uh, have a great week. We'll be back with uh, this group at the end of March uh, for our last session. In the meantime, try to put in play some of the things that we've looked at and talked about. And we'll just see you at the end of March. Have a great day. Thank you. See you guys. <laughs>